Well, Marshtown High School is basically hosting this event, so I guess I've been the host for that. We've been making sure that you know they've got clay ready when they need it, and we've given them the facilities and the places to work, and taking care of the pots when they're done, which we're more than happy to do. They can leave all they want. Um, they're really awesome. Um, I guess my involvement came about from John Mueller. You know, he took takes our adult ed pottery class, and he's talking about different people that can come in and said he had this opportunity to get James Leedy and Tom to come in and do their thing here and it's been great. Um, yesterday my high school kids had the opportunity to spend their class period with Tom and with James and they ate that up. That was just awesome to watch them interact with both of those artists and the opportunity for those kids to meet somebody like James Leedy and Tom Harnick. It's just been tremendous. Yeah. I first met Jim Leedy when I was working for June Kaneko, a very famous ceramist from Omaha, Nebraska, and June took us down to Jim Leedy's studio in Kansas City, the Leedy Volkus Art Center. And um, there I met uh, Jim Leedy and Peter Volkus and a host of other artists. And um, we were just introduced up on the fourth floor where they began to play banjo and guitar. And so uh, since then it's been kind of uh, just seeing Jim in Kansas City or seeing him at uh, national conferences and stuff like that and always talking to him and then uh, in 2004 we did a workshop at Omaha Clayworks in Omaha Nebraska and it was with Jeff Weinman and Jim Leedy and Jim came up from Kansas City and we made a bunch of work and then uh, I fired it in my wood burning kiln and ever since then Jim's had me as his right-hand man, uh, making his clay work for him and uh, firing his wo uh, pieces in my wood-burning kiln. My pal, uh, Tom and, and Dean, um, they made things for me, made shapes. And that makes it a lot easier for me. You know, I don't need to make the forms, the shapes. All I have to do is put them together so that's real easy, and Tommy's excellent at it. We've been together long enough and uh, doing workshops together and, uh, and, and working together that he knows exactly what I need. He, you know, I could actually say, you know, Tommy, take and make a piece for me, you know. But, you know, it doesn't work that way. So <clears throat> today we came in and he had he and he had made all of these forms for me. Uh, uh, we call them plugs, you know. And I'll take these plugs and then put them together and make something. Well, the first thing I did when we came in t today, uh, I I thought, you know, probably the best way to introduce the people here to how I do my work is to have them do a, a little pr problem that I often have them do. And I, I went to the blackboard and I drew a square and I asked someone, come up and put a mark on this, in this square, or rectangle, whatever it was. So someone reluctantly came up, said, what do you want me to do? I said, I don't care, just put a mark and put a mark. Okay, everybody look at that mark. Now, where does it need another mark? You know, that this person has destroyed the beauty of this simple square. Now where do you need another mark? So, so you come up, you know? And the next post person reluctantly came up and put a mark. Before that was over, I had to sh sh run them off. And they just got so into it, it was great. And that's the way I work. That's why I do that is I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't make sketches for what I'm going to do. I, um, I make a mark, whether it's on clay or whether it's on a canvas or whatever. I make a mark. And then that mark suggests another mark. And that suggests another mark. Or may, maybe next time some oh, that's too many straight marks, maybe the next one it should be a curve and it's built that way. So, you know, I had Tom, uh, Tom and Dean make some forms, throw some shapes. 
So it's the same way. I said, okay, like, guys, let's, uh, let's try stacking this shape on top of that shape, see what happens. Oh, okay, that's, that's very nice, I like that. So let's seal it up and, and glue it down. But it needs something else, doesn't it? You know, and I try to collaborate with my audience when I have an audience, whether it's a Tom or whether it's Dean or whether it's the people there. Or when I'm in my own studio, obviously I can't do that. But um, so what do we think? What do you think we? What, do we, what does it need now? Maybe it needs a handle. Anyone know where a handle should go? Mm, everybody's kind of timid, you know. What about you? Where do you think a handle should go? Oh, okay. <laughs> so it starts from there. And the first piece that we built, I didn't touch it. Uh, and it's the big piece, I think it's behind me. Yeah. Um, it, it was built just by doing that. Now what do you, what do you think it needs? What do you think it needs? And then what do you think it needs? And we built a great piece. And uh, I'll be happy to sign it, you know, uh, with everybody else. Uh, I was a conductor of the orchestra, you know. Okay, well, what we have here is a collaboration of all the people that are involved in this workshop. And um, really, it's a tr transfer of ideas from the chalkboard to three-dimensional media clay. And um, everyone got to take a little swipe at this too, just like creating a line on the board. They were able to add something or put a big hole into it or to do something unique to make this piece uh, what it is right now. And uh, it started off this morning. It was a perfectly symmetrical large vase that we made yesterday. And then today was the Leedy influence, the Jim Leedy influence of trying to get people to work in the now. So this is um, what they created. It's really done in the, the school of abstract expressionists, which uh, Jim Leedy is one of the last living abstract expressionists in America. I had to go into the army. I just started a little earlier than that. I'm from a large family and I was not gonna ask my parents to send me to college. And a way to, in, in that, those days when it's the beginning of the Korean War, uh, you could stay out of the war if you went to college. Well, I, I was not going to ask my parents to send me to college. You know, they got a lot of kids. So I figured, how the hell can I go to college? And I thought, well, I can join the Army. So I went down to join the Army, and they said, well, it's going to take four years. And I said, I don't want to go for four years. Well, if you will go and ask your draft board to draft you, it's only two years. Right on. So I went to my draft board, put me at the head of the group, and I got drafted. And went to Korea and became a military photographer. And, and it was interesting. Uh, like most people in a war, they don't really want to talk about it, but I don't care. Um, but I got through it and I came home and I got a discharge and I had the GI Bill. Right away I went to school, you know. And after I finished my bachelor's degree, I was in a hurry. All of my friends were about to gra graduate and I was just starting. so. I promised myself I'd graduate with them. So I accelerated. And I graduated in two years and two summers. Well, that just gave me then the opportunity to go to graduate school. And now I could apply for aid from schools because I made pretty good grades. And uh, so they. I applied to Columbia University and they gave me a scholarship. I said, I'm off to Columbia. And um, it was a fortunate, very fortunate accident in a way. I, did, I, I knew there, there were people coming into their own called abstract expressionists. 
But I'm basically a country boy. I didn't know what the heck that was. And um, I, but I went to Columbia because it's a great, great university. And uh, I realized that uh, all the, all of these artists were get, becoming well known. People like Jackson Pollock and and De Kooning and Klein and a whole bunch of people that were making it big. I really liked what they were doing. So I, uh, Columbia University is way up the Manhattan Island, like 180 or something, and, and the village is down around 12th Street. So I would run after school. I didn't have much money, you know. And the subway only cost a nickel, but times were different. And um, so I would run down the subway and spend the evening w sitting around in a place called the Cedar Bar. It's where the artists were hanging out and getting recognized and becoming big time artists. And so I went down there uh, every day after school and I would hang out and listen to these guys, these older guys, you know. So I got to know some of them. You know, who is this guy? You know, he's hanging out. But there was one person I didn't, I wanted to meet desperately. I loved his work. I wanted to talk to him. And he was never there. His name was de Kooning, Willem de Kooning. And they kept saying, yeah, he comes in here every once in a while. But since he's making it big, now he's too good for us, you know. So um, I went down one night and I thought, mm, I don't, uh, I don't want to go in there tonight. Uh, so I walked down the street about a block or a block and a half and there was another bar and it was named Dillon Bar. And I looked in, there were some people sitting in a booth and a beautiful woman sitting in the back of, on, the, uh, on a stool. And I looked at her and I thought, I know her. She probably goes to uh, Columbia. I'll go in and talk to her. And I went over and, <clears throat> and sat down and said, do you go to Columbia University? And she said, no. No, you probably have seen me on TV. I'm a singer and I've been on TV. Said, oh, yeah, maybe. But while I was talking to her, this guy came out of, I heard him coming out of the booth and he came over and he drug me off of the, the stool. And I didn't know, know who he was. We were wrestling around and you know, he was strong, but he was drunk and I was not drunk. And I pinned him down finally. And when I pinned him down, his drunken buddies came out of the booth and pulled me off and they took him back to the booth and I went back up, you know, and I just, you know, knocked this guy down and sat down and this woman says, you know who you're fighting with? I said, no, I have no idea. She says, he's a famous artist. I said, who? Well, that's, his name is Bill de Kooning. My heart dropped, you know. That's the one person that I wanted to meet, desperately wanted to meet. So I'm sitting there thinking, like, all red-faced and blushed, you know, and I'll never get to meet this guy now. Oh, I really screwed up. And in a little bit, I heard him crawling out of the booth again and coming toward me. And I'm thinking, like, he can beat me up, man. I am not going to fight Bill de Kooning, now that I know who he is. But he didn't come and grab me around the neck this time. He sat down in the booth beside me, and I, I didn't look. But if you can feel someone's eyes burning your side, yeah, I could, you know. Like, and um, pretty soon he touched me. And I looked around, and he says, Hey, kid, you know who I am? You know, he was an important guy. And I said, yeah, I know who you are. Because she just told me, you know. You know who I am? You don't care, do you? And I said, I don't care who you are. 
And he said, hey kid, I think I like you. And he grabbed me by the neck and he drug me over into the booth and we became friends. And just because I, I didn't, you know, uh, worship him. But the truth of the matter was, I was worshiping him. Well, that's a story I often tell because it's a fun story. But it's the way I got into the in group, so to speak. I'm a student at Columbia University and these famous artists are hanging out at this bar. But Bill had graduated from that bar. He, he, he went up the street and that's where I met him. But um, so we became friends and he would take me to his studio or with his other drinking buddies, you know. He was good, he was good with the, the booze, as most of those guys were. And so I, I wanted to paint like them, but I thought, that's ridiculous. I, they're older than me, they invented this way of painting, and I'm just a young guy that's coming into the group. The last thing I want to do is paint like them. I'm gonna find my own style. Well, I was taking ceramics at the university. Uh, well, maybe I'm going to do abstract expressionist ceramics. So I started r taking my pots and ripping them and putting them back together and splashing uh, bright uh, glazes on them and so on. And some of the best things I ever made was, was there. And they were only about this big. And uh, I was on my way. New York sent me on my way, but <clears throat> but then I graduated. I went to another school and another school. I loved going to school. And I wound up teaching at the University of Montana in Missoula. And that's when uh, two guys that became my best friends was Rudy Adio and Peter Volkus. And uh, they had gone to school in Montana. And I'm teaching there now, but they're my age. And um, so we became best friends. And for the rest of my life, sort of the three of us became the, the leaders, so to speak, if you can say that. Important movers in a, per in a, uh, a period of ceramics. Uh, pottery called uh, Abstract Expressionist Pottery. And there were other movements that came along. Pete, Pete wound up teaching it in California and he had followers there. And Rudy and I had followers in the University of Montana. And then I went to uh, Ohio University to teach. And, you know, I had followers there. And then I went to the Kansas City Art Institute. and. Then I had some people there that I was teaching art history. I had done a you know a doctorate in art history because I didn't want to teach art. Uh, I thought you know I want to make art. I don't want to teach art, but I've got to make a living, don't I? So I said, well, you know, art historians are pretty scarce, and uh, I bet I can get a job teaching art history. So. I studied art history and became a scholar in art history. And then I did get jobs. My first job was teaching art history at the University of Montana. But when I, before I went there, I said, I'll take the job if you will give me a studio somewhere on campus. Because I'm also an artist, a painter and a sculptor and potter. And they said, oh yeah, sure, we will. Well, when I got there, I already had a baby and a son, and we got there, and I went in, and the first time I'm looking for is, where's my studio? He said, what do you mean, where's your studio? And I said, I told you I had to have a studio, or I wouldn't come here. They said, were you serious? I said, yeah, I was serious. I'm an artist. So they gave me... There was a, a, where it had been a dance ballet place on the top floor. They gave me that as my studio. I was a man. 
So all of my art history students, they were just art majors, and they came up there and they painted, and I, my buddy Rudy Adio was teaching ceramics, so we talked together in ceramics, and my buddy Peter Vokas was at Berkeley, but he was out. He's from Montana, and he's a mommy's boy. And he had to come and see mommy all the time, you know? I mean, really, literally, he was. And um, so we became best friends. And uh, that friendship lasted until a few years ago when both of my best friends went to the, the other place. You know, they've gone, but they left me here to talk about them. I think before I met Jim, I was judgmental of my work. I would, uh, if I wasn't happy with something, I would either reclaim it or throw it in the trash or something like that. And Jim has really uh, kind of brought me into the light of taking a second look at things and not being judgmental and really of trying to uh, give it time to grow on you and look at it. And, and so that's been a big, big influence. And just, uh, just having the ability to work with a, a great master is just, it's, uh, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity that most people don't get. As a potter, you know, this is great, but then you, you find out you've got just people still like Jim Leedy who's still around and he, he's still working. And then you're asked to be an assistant for Jim Leedy. You jump on that. I jumped on that. This has been a, 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 a really remarkable thing to work with somebody at that caliber. Somebody who's taking things and just, like was said before, it was out, totally outside the box and just really creating, you know? And uh, it's just, a, a, it was really inspiring and, and, and it's really tiring too. Some of these big pieces are heavy, and, 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 but it, it was, it's been fun. Yeah. A real artist never stops. I, you know, it's not like a profession that uh, I'm going to be a teacher and then I can't wait until I retire and so I can go to Florida. You know, it's not that way with a real artist. Um, a lot of people do do that, but I'm an artist. And a lot of my students, are, that's the way I taught them, you know. Take it serious. Give it, give it your life to it. You know, it's a wonderful, wonderful business to be in. Now you can't make much money, so you're going to have to get a job teaching, or you're going to have to get a job, a job working people's gardens or whatever, but it's worth it to be able to go to your studio every day and make art. So I have never retired and I never will retire. You know, when, when they are dragging me off, I'll still be reaching back for a lump of clay, you know? I'm not ready to go yet. But, you know, you don't retire from, from being an artist, not a real artist. <laughs>